Welcome to Said Unsaid, things you'll say at your kitchen table that you probably wouldn't say in public. I'm your host, Gloria Neal, and for the next 30 minutes, we will jump into the deep end of uncomfortable conversations with respect and honesty and openness and, at times, a little humor. This show will open the door to conversations we have all thought about or wished we had the courage to openly express, but may not be socially acceptable to publicly express them. This show will strive to be several things, including leaving you better than we found you. My goal as your host is to leave you with less questions and more answers at the end of each episode. This week, I'll take a look at the relationships between black and white women, specifically how we have learned to understand one another. Or have we? Here are a few things I heard. My relationship, you know, between black and white women, I would say has been good all my life because mm -hmm. I grew up living in, I was a military child. Oh. So I lived in a, many different places, many different communities. I've had, you know, every school I went to was people of all different colors. There's a huge disconnect between black women and white women. I mean, they don't work together. They're always um, vying each other. Generally, white women have a lot of apologizing to do for being in every single environment I can think of. I see a lot of people that, you know, would just kind of look the other direction. They don't want to get in the mix and have these uncomfortable conversations. As street canvassers, we engage a lot with all different types of people and when we're doing door-to-door -door campaigns and the amount of times that our coworkers of color have had the cops call on them by white women trying to be protective of their property that they think is so important. Black women and white women together, they're not working together. Same with, you know, Hispanic women and Orientals. Those people like to stay with their kind. I think that we all have to play a role as white people in engaging with those prejudices that we hold, whether we realize them or not, unconscious bias or conscious bias. and playing a role in the outside world when we do see things, taking a step to use our privilege to fight for other people, I feel like that's the bare minimum. So, you heard it. My guest today is Regina Jackson, co-creator of Race to Dinner and co-author of White Women, everything you already know about your own racism and how to do better. Of which a docudrama was born. That docudrama is called Deconstructing Karen. So, welcome, Regina. Thank you for having show. me. Oh my gosh, it's so good to finally have you here. Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. So first tell me, how did Race to Dinner come about and which then led to a book, then led to this docudrama? So take me back. Um, Syra Rao ran for Congress against longtime Democrat Diana DeGette. Mm -hmm. And when Syra ran, her whole platform was anti-racism. So what happened, every time she would give a speech or a talk or whatever, white women would line up around the block and what they wanted to say to Syra was, not me, mm -hmm. I'm not racist. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, this went on for a while and I had a friend in the neighborhood, white woman friend who said, I'm done with Syra, she hates white people, but <laughs> if you can get her to go lunch with me, I'd like to do that. And you know, I know what she was gonna say. Yeah. So I went to Syra and Syra says, I'm not doing that anymore. But if your friend wants to host a dinner and invite some of her white lady friends and you do it with me, we can do that. Wow. So we did that couple of times and then we looked at each other and we said, wow, you know, this is really worth having these conversations. So we started a business, a f not a for-profit, not right. a not-for-profit mm -hmm, business. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2019. We've been doing the dinners um, since then. Then came the documentary because there was a white woman director out of Hollywood who had been following Syra, mm -hmm. and she contacted us and said, I want to do a documentary on your work. Oh my God. We looked at each other, says, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Next thing we know, she showed up in Denver with a film crew. Wow. And then we wrote the book. I've seen you in venues where you're being asked these questions. How did you get there from here? And what do you say to those people who say, this is not about racist, this is about combating racism? Yes, yes, we're not trying to be racist. What we're trying to do, our whole goal, one of the reasons I believe that we've not been able to solve racism in this country is we don't have the hard conversations. Um, black people tip around, tiptoe around white people's feelings and white people like 
whatever you say, they're going to be uncomfortable, but we need to recognize there is no change without discomfort. So let's start having the hard conversations. Mm -hmm. The other thing is let's all tell the truth. And I always go back, one of my favorite uh, authors is James Baldwin. Yes. And he says, white people know everything they need to know about racism. He said, they know they wouldn't want to be black here. He said, everything else they say is a lie. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's right on. They wouldn't want to trade places with us, and the reason why is they know. Well, you asked the question yeah. in your forums. You say, how many people in this auditorium, in this place, wherever the event is, would trade places with a black person? And usually no one raises their hand, and I'm talking about a pack. Mm -hmm. room. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of white people look around at other white people and they're kind of shocked and surprised, but you say, I'm not. Yeah. It, you know, I'm not shocked at all because we know. We know and they know. Right. Okay. Right. Black people know because from the very top, we're little. We have learned to recognize when it's safe when it's not safe, when to say something, yeah. when yeah. to not. So we know. Yeah. You know, we have that emotional intelligence yeah. from growing up black in this society. The biggest misunderstanding between race to dinner. In other words, when you had individuals come to your house, there were two rules. What were they as white women came to your house? There's really only one rule, and that rule is you cannot cry at the dinner table. Well, I thought they had to participate as well. Oh, yes. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. We don't say that so much, but we call we call them out. So we will say, you know, what do you... But, yeah, no crying. And we all know what that's about. Um, you know, there's a history of black men being lynched um, around white women's... You know, I just saw one today from the uh, lynching monument, yep. and it said he made a white woman uncomfortable. Yep. So... No, yep. you cannot cry in here. You're referring to the Lynch Memorial that is in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, Montgomery, Montgomery Alabama. Montgomery, excuse me. Alabama. Yeah. Yes. And so with that, mm -hmm. we look at all of the things that have culminated to get us here. You and Syra, who is also the other half of this duo, yes. and you've talked about her, you're really trying to raise the consciousness of white women while spurring action. Yes, and that's the whole point. You know, I think. A lot of what, well, I shouldn't say I think. There is a pyramid of white supremacy. I don't know if anybody's seen it. And at the very bottom of the pyramid is indifference. So if you are indifferent to other people's pain and suffering, then you're allowing all those other things to happen right up to genocide. So mm. we try and say, okay, this may not be your priority, but why would you be indifferent? Yeah. Yeah, because really, in essence, you're saying that the indifference is a part of the racism. It when is. When you look the other way. That's right. Right? You pretend like you don't see stuff. Do you understand why this could be perceived as a threat? When white women hear this, because you can see them, whether they have on pearls or not, they're clutching something, right? Yes. When they're hearing yes. this, or when you say, how many of you in here are racist? Mm -hmm. You know what I know? I know that once you acknowledge something, then you are required to either make a change or make a decision. Either way, it's a decision to continue as things are. And I think a lot of people don't want to make that decision. It's easier to say, well, I don't know, than it is to say, yeah, I'm a racist and I need to do some work. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the pushback you've received as a result of this brave work. Um, all kinds of pushback. You know, we, Syra likes to call it uh, White Women, the Broadway musical. <laughs> she said, <laughs> you know, you've got the arms crossed, you've got the eyes rolling, mm -hmm. you've got the civil rights resume. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've seen it all. Mm -hmm. We really mm -hmm. have seen it all. Mm -hmm. Because the words racist triggers them. Yes. To disprove that they are that, when in actuality you're saying, in many ways, it's unconscious because the system is those who have been in it the longest and those who've prospered from it. Well, you know what? I, I don't like to use the word unconscious because mm -hmm. then <laughs> we go back to they know everything they need to know, which is they know they don't want to be us. That's not unconscious, is it? 
that's no, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's based on knowing that you don't want to be treated as a black person in this society. So I don't, there's words I don't use, microaggressions, yeah. nope, unconscious bias, nope, they know. So I think what I like to do is stay focused on, mm -hmm. you know, it's not even an elephant in the room. It's the room, it's the air, it's the water. Racism. It's systemic. Yes. And anti-blackness is as much a part of this country as is the Constitution. Right when you start to, well, of course, because it's in the Constitution, yep. right? Yeah. I mean, two-thirds of a person. Right. Okay. So, but if you look at the progression of where we started. have come from, where we started, mm -hmm. and where we are now, we all know, yes, there's progress that's been made. I always like to say it's more covert than overt yes. as it was in the 40s, 50s, yes. 20s. And, yes, right? absolutely. But even with that, when you say race to dinner and you're telling white women this is a part of the problem, you are a part of that problem, and you can fix that, yep. you're not saying us against them. You're saying we need you in this fight. Exactly. You know, um, right now our big issue is guns. As we all know, more American children are killed by guns than anything else in our yeah. society. Do we all have a role in that as adults? Absolutely. Are we all, do we all need to be engaged in fixing that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I don't care. You can be purple, green, blue, red. As, as functional practicing adults, we <laughs> need to come together and fix the issue. Right. And so you're juxtaposing that next to where we are with racism, which, too, and when they talk about pandemic, epidemic, or it is a sickness in this country, until it is dealt with, it will continue to bear some pretty nasty fruit. Yeah, and you know, I don't want to be the person saying to my great-grandchildren, oh yeah, I didn't do anything because I was too scared. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, grandchildren, nieces, nephews across the board, yeah. you name it. So specifically, what do you want white women to step up to do during this time in our history as a country? If I were to go outside on the sidewalk and beat my dog, a hundred white people would be over there. <laughs> but you let a black person be arrested or mistreated or even stopped by the police, everybody just pretends like they don't mm. see anything. I want people to step up and start using their voice to stop oppression, violence, bigotry, all of it. Just use your voice. Right. I always often equate it to when people say, well, Gloria, I'm, you know, I'm in a room full of white people. I said, that's a perfect opportunity. That's your audience. Yes. And what we say to white women is, start with your own self. Start deconstructing your own racism. Because you know what? As Cyrus says, we all come out of the same sausage factory. No when you come out of the sausage factory, you are in fact a sausage, okay? <laughs> I took the Harvard bias and I came out moderately biased towards white children. I came out of the sausage factory too. So all of us, we all have to look internal, find out what those things are that keeps us from being a decent human being, and that's what I call it, a decent human being. Oh my goodness, no, this is so great. So we hear the words white privilege all the time, mm -hmm. right? We mm -hmm. hear it a lot. What do you mean by that phrase and how can people better understand this? And by that I mean, I've said to my friends, I've used you know, the phrase and I've said, you know what? There is a thing as white privilege, mm -hmm. and I explain it as this stream, mm -hmm. and you jump in the stream, and the stream is the system, and the system is built to help you go along. So you're swimming with the stream. You're swimming, yeah. you know, black person jumps in that same stream. You're swimming up against the stream. That's right. Harder, twice as fast, but you got to work twice as hard. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that you have not worked hard, white people, for white privilege? Or But the system was designed to help you. That's right. And so when you explain this to them or understand, because I don't want anyone to say, I didn't work hard. That's I've right. worked hard for what I've That's gotten. Right. Why can't you do it? We have not all started out from the same spot, That's equity right. versus equality. Talk to me a little bit about that piece and help people understand that white privilege phrase better. Because it's not an attack phrase. No. It is a, I'm trying to help you to better understand this. Well, and it came out of, that phrase came out of a book by Robin D'Angelo, mm -hmm. where she talked about exactly what you said. You know, almost all these systems in the United States 
were uh, started and benefit white people, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So let's say I wanted to go and get a job, for instance, at the phone company, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go through a series of, uh, if I'm lucky, if my name is Shaniqua, or Shanene, <laughs> I may never even get a call, yeah. right? Yeah, And that's, that's how true. those oppressive systems work. Well, we know this black person, so we're not calling Shanika. Right, okay. <laughs> right. So, right. Uh, you but know, we will if call I'm a, Leslie. a Susie yes. <laughs> or a <laughs> yep. Karen, <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> I'm yes. gonna get a call back. Yeah. That's systemic oppression, mm -hmm. okay? And I think, I think everybody's raving about how low the jobless uh, yeah, the job unemployment rate is, right. yes. But it's still very high in the black community. Sure. And that's because black people don't get the same opportunities right. for employment. When, when I go into a store or someplace and I see um, mm -hmm. black people employed, what goes through my mind is, gee, they probably couldn't find anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know what, but I'm being yeah. very serious yes, about yes, that. Yes, yes, Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no, it, we're getting those opportunities now. Right, absolutely. When you flip that and you talk to your white girlfriends or white colleagues that you know, because I understand you retired from corporate America, mm -hmm. your bluntness and directness now is very different than when than I it yep. was. Right. Yep. Talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, when you get those opportunities in a corporate America, and, and I can go back and tell you, I started in the 70s, okay? Mm -hmm. That's when AT&T at that time was the largest employer in the country outside of the government, wow. okay? So they had a consent decree filed against them for discrimination. So what they started doing in the 70s is hiring more and more black people. But what they did, if you were a black woman, they wanted to put you in operator services, which is a 24, 24 seven operation. So I, I said, I'm not interested in 24 seven. So I waited and I finally got in the business office. I have about maybe 130 representatives. There were maybe two, two black women and maybe two white men, okay? So that also is that systemic stuff. And yeah. when you, and yeah. I was able to rise up the ladder, and the reason was, is I had male mentors. Mm. I worked for the first black officer at US West. Uh -huh. I went in to complain about my boss, mm -hmm. white woman from Iowa, who mm. wanted to know why I wasn't at my desk. And I said, um, <laughs> do you mean like when I'm not here or when I'm, when I'm not in the building or when I'm not in the office? She said, yes. So I went to complain and he said, Regina, I want you to take this job and come and work for me. So I got a promotion and I reported directly to the black man. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and then you know my career yeah. kept, but it was always because yeah. I had mentors. Yeah. And yeah. you still have to walk on eggshells yeah. because if white people feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. around you, mm -hmm. oh, she's too boisterous, she's mm -hmm. too loud, like they'd hate you and be glowing. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You know, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten sent home for hurting some white woman's feelings at work. But it happens. But to your point, and you know mm -hmm. that that it's like, well, how did I hurt her feelings when, in fact, she said worse than I said. But all of those things have shaped us to either be better yep. than we were or you worse. Are. And I would like to think we are better. Trying to explain or trying to better understand and help society grow in mm -hmm. this struggle, and trust, mm -hmm. it is a struggle. But tell me about the white women who have participated in Race to Dinner, the wide range of emotions that you have seen as a result of this and now being on this side of corporate America oh, yeah. and what you know for sure. What I know for sure is um, I am going to speak the truth mm -hmm. as I have lived it. Mm -hmm. And if someone doesn't like it, not my problem. Mm -hmm. I am not responsible. None of us are responsible for what someone else feels. I think that's one thing that white women really don't have that we have because white women have been socialized mm -hmm. to be nice, okay, mm -hmm. over everything else, mm -hmm. to be perfect, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. to not mm -hmm. cause anybody any headaches or, you know, just right. that whole thing right. where we have had to learn to be tough. Because survival. That's right. To survive. Survival. So that is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I have had white women say to me, well, you hurt my feelings. And you know, I like to say, well, mm, to take, the, it to I know. <laughs> take it to the altar. Take it to the altar. You know, that has nothing to do with me. Oh my God. Right. And, and to your point, I mean, that's absolutely right. That's across 
the board. But to your point, it is so very true that the emotion, the emotional, how shall I say, the, e the emotional quotient that we deal with and have to deal with, it becomes very, very painful because the burden, the heavier burden, is on always pa bears on the black woman. Mm -hmm. And it really has been a very heavy burden to bear. But that being said, you have now done race to dinner. You have had many women, white women, around mm -hmm. your table eating food, talking, and hearing things that not only make them uncomfortable, I'm sure probably some of them had indigestion. <laughs> In just a minute, we are going to have Kathy Duda join us in this discussion uh, because she was, Kathy joined yes. Race to Dinner, and she was one of the participants. Tell me what surprised you about her, and how did that all come to be? Um, I think Kathy had been doing the work for a while, mm -hmm. so I want to give that. She attended a dinner, and she hosted a dinner, and, um, you know, she, she is uh, not a person to bite her tongue. You know, she has a lot of emotional talent. She's in touch with herself. Yeah. And the biggest thing is, I said, I started with, start with yourself, then go and get your friends. Mm -hmm. Bring your people in, your parents, your family, mm -hmm. your friends, the people who know you, care you, like you, Yeah. bring them in, yeah. bring them in, and keep having those conversations. And Kathy does that. That is so, so very powerful. Well, you know what? I want to go ahead and just bring Kathy up and welcome her to the set because it has, when you told me that, I was like, oh my goodness, this is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So welcome to the show, Kathy. Thank you for having me, I'm glad to be here. Oh, it is so good that you were here. So I'm thinking, okay, and I've seen the docudrama, I have talked to Regina, I've talked to Syra. When you think about the first time you walked into Race to Dinner, having done the work or not, how did you feel? Take us back. So I do remember when Syra asked that question of who here is a racist. I mean, I was like, whew, we're going to start. <laughs> we're diving right in. There's right. no warming up. That's right. Um, but it was a really, I think one of the best things that Syra was really good at doing was she herself was quick to jump in and mm -hmm. raise her hand. She didn't let people sit for very long. There, she let, she, there was a pause for discomfort. There was yeah. a pause to give a chance for yeah. people to respond. And that sort of builds a bridge. When you realize that someone else can talk about their own biases, you know, Syra talks about her own anti-blackness, it opens up this door of, mm -hmm. it's that bringing people in versus just calling them out and sitting like this and judging. And then it also then gives room for the shame. You know, you can take that cloak of shame yeah. off yeah. and say, okay, we're gonna get real. Let's yeah. talk about this. And so when you got real and y'all started talking about this, because it's not something that you leave at the table, right? No, when you right. leave no. race to dinner, it's in the car with you, it's in the bedroom, you thinking about it all. Because once the door is open, you cannot go back. Exactly. You can't go back. So you chose to make your mess your message. 100%. 100. And, and it had been a long message, like Regina had said. I mean, I feel like, for me, it started even when I was 17. I mean, my father told me a long time ago, this was one of the most racist countries in the world. And he said, I had a black friend had come to pick me up. And my mother actually, who had, she was an engineer. She had, she had always given accolades to her boss, who was a black man, mm -hmm. a young black man at 32, had to hire my mom for the city of Chicago because a white man would not hire her. And he said to us at her funeral, he said, I had to hire her because I was 32 and I needed wisdom and experience. Mm -hmm. So she had always given him accolades. But all of a sudden she finds out I'm going to a party with a black friend. She's like, oh my God, what are the neighbors gonna think? <laughs> and I mean, I'm looking at my dad like, who is she? <laughs> and what, what is she talking about? And mm -hmm. it was the next day that my dad pulled me aside and said, look, we're not, I'm, I can't tell you how you're gonna live your life. You have to decide for yourself, but this is the most racist country in the world. And if you're gonna choose this path, you have to be strong. Mm. And at the time, I naively was like, dad, that's your generation. We're not gonna worry about it, we're fine. Oh. Boy. And then I went to an all a college that was predominantly white, and you're like, "Whoa, well, let the learning begin. Let, yeah. let 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 the you know the witnessing start." And and um, and so that journey kind of started back before 
but I realized with Regina and Syra, they sort of catapulted me out of this comfort zone because I had been doing the work and I was comfortable. But right. you get really comfortable saying, I'm here to listen and learn. Right. Yeah. Can't that tell is you way how many too times comfortable. We've, yes, right. way we've too comfortable. That. Or, yeah. that, or that whole adage yeah. of, well, you know, I really don't see color. I yeah. said, okay, let me stop you. Mm -hmm. It's not that you don't see it. It's what you do about what you That's see. That's right. Yes. And so this epiphany that you had in saying, I know I'm going to have to do this work. I cannot run from this anymore. How does that make you feel when you hear that, when you have this awakening? It feels like, um, first of all, this work, everything we've done has been organic. So it feels like we are doing what we're intended to That's do. That's right. And, you know, a dinner of eight people, if two people walk away committed to the work, I feel like I've done what I can do. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm proud of that. I'm, um, I keep community with these people. You know, Kathy's going to be part of my life. Yes. <laughs> No question, she is a part of your yeah. life. Because this part, when you go into a room and you hear your white friends or white colleagues or white family members say something or do, and there's that moment where the pecker factor gets really, really, you know, when you're like, ooh, everybody gets very, very tight. You now versus you maybe 15 years ago, what's the difference? I, well, first of all, everyone expects me at this point to say something. <laughs> there is no doubt. I mean, the, 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 the eyes come but rolling. But that's changed. Like, that's and how that, change that's happens. changed. And um, the difference is I don't mince words anymore. And now it doesn't matter. My family was a loud, boisterous family. I call my mom on that stuff all the time, Like, whereas a lot of people have trouble in their own family. Right. That right. was not an issue. I could be a kind of bad ass. <laughs> right, right. In my family. Everybody loved me there. We could we could yell and scream and, and then walk away and have dessert. That's right. just the way I was raised. But right. my friends or where I, the people I was taught to make comfortable my home, that mm -hmm. niceness, that you don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. It was always walking that like, well, right. I should say something, but then I'm I'm also worried about these two ladies over here, and are they going to be uncomfortable even this is the person I should be talking to? And now that doesn't happen. I don't mince words. I call it like it is. I tell them how it makes me feel and how inappropriate it is. And it worked, too. I meant that phase where, you know, I get it. I, if I was in my 20s, you have a lot more to give up. If you're expecting that boss or that person you're, you're working for to give you a promotion, you have a lot more to lose to say something. Whereas now I'm like... I, I'll say it. I'll call you out on it. I don't, and, and I know that there's a freedom there, too. So, so. yeah, in that freedom, and I, I even talked I to Regina that, about yes. this, especially being out of corporate America. Mm -hmm. But let me push back a little bit, mm -hmm. because sure. when you're in your 20s and you're in your 30s or 40s or wherever you are in your career, it, it, leadership is never safe. Right. Leadership does never say, well, you know, today I'm going to take the day off, and I'm not <laughs> right. going to really say anything, even though I heard what they... You as an individual, as a white woman who is half privileged to be in those rooms where the doors are still closed for me and for Regina yes. and people like us, what do you say to help those women get that intestinal fortitude that says, no, no, you need to say something, whether it is right then and there or whether it is after the moment? Because really what I found what people are doing when they're saying it in the moment, yep. right, those people who are offending yes. and saying something, they're testing the waters. Yes. If nobody pushes back, they just grew about six feet. Mm -hmm. When you push back, yes. they grow not so far because there may be some people in the room who agree with them, but they get to find out that's not acceptable yeah. anymore. What do you say to give those women courage without, because to me, a career loss, when you say, well, it's not really a career loss, especially in this economy. If you are a white person, you can find a job, trust. 100%. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Give them some of your wisdom as you walk this walk as a white woman. So I think leading through example by being that person to actually do the stepping in. And then I do a lot of circling back. So it's like, did you guys understand what just happened there? You know, yeah. what just, can we talk about that a little bit? Did you see how every woman of color came to your aid? I, I have no problem circling back and saying, let's see how we could, like the Monday morning quarterbacking, let's see what could we have all done a little differently there? Right. And I also try to call myself out. I've, I've had opportunities where I know it's gonna be the rolled eyes because I do say this all the time. So I oftentimes will give space yeah. to see if someone else who might be more effective in that moment, let's give them a chance to jump in. If they don't jump in, then I'll jump in. But let's give that pause 
and then accolades on the back. I mean, people like to know, like, I appreciate what you said. I, you know, I am so thrilled you actually brought that up because I think people become, they feel safer right. when someone validates yes. what they did. Right, so. right. Regina, how does that make you feel to really know that your work, you and Cyrus' work, is really giving birth to advocates who are strong like this, who look very different from us. I always say when the murder of George Floyd happened, as horrible as that was, and I remember seeing an older white woman, it was just a picture, but she was in Glenwood Springs holding up a sign saying Black Lives Matter on the corner. And I was like, ooh, honey, we have turned the corner, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And so, but to have, you're touching, you're going to Atlanta, you're, you've been in Canada, you and Cyril, with all of these, it continues, film festivals, how does it make you feel that you are creating this type of advocacy and advocates? It's what I'm intended to do. And one of the things, when we talk about it, we are always uh, very careful to say to white women, if you're going to be in this work, there are no gains, okay? You might be losing friends, you might be losing family members, you might be losing jobs. Mm -hmm. And what you need to understand is, your people on the other side. So you will gain yourself, your humanity, and your people, your community is on the other side of all of this. And I like to say, just to add a little humor, in four years, we have not lost a white woman yet. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> not one has died, not one. <laughs> that is, I, I think it is so, so very powerful. Because sometimes you gotta laugh with this, otherwise you will be crying, yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You lose those family members, and I know I've got to wrap up, but you lose those family members, and you lose them, but you don't really. I always like to say when individuals are upset with you, mm -hmm. it's because you've challenged their way of thinking. Because yes. if they didn't care, it wouldn't bother them. That's right. Right? Yes. And so when you do this work, when you are out there saying the things you say, when you are out there saying the things you say as it relates to this is wrong, mm -hmm. it's not just good enough to look the other way, I, too, must own this. Mm -hmm. because complacency is a part of the problem. Yep. Right. So, no, you guys have been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for all. having Thank us. You, Thank Kat. you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is good. It is good. I would certainly like to thank my guests this week, Regina Jackson and Kathy Duda. I always say Duda, Duda. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love that. I love that. But if you want more information about Race to Dinner, the film Deconstructing Karen, or even the book titled White Women, Everything You Already Knew About Your Own Racism and How to Do Better, we have a link at pbs12.org forward slash said unsaid. So, for said unsaid, thank you for joining me. Until next time, I'm your host, Gloria Neal. If you say it, own it. It may be exactly what's needed for more positive and painfully enlightening conversations. Thank you.